Okay, so what did we talk about last time? Uh, last time we did all this kind of LQR with quaternion stuff, right? And talked about how to actually, we spent like three lectures doing all this weird attitude SO3 quaternion stuff and then optimization with that stuff. And then finally, the punchline last time was here's LQR with quaternions. Hey, check it out. You can do insane things with quad rotors with this stuff. It's pretty cool. From there, you know, getting that into all the other things we talked about is pretty straightforward. You can do convex MPC with it. You can do trad drop with it, all the other stuff. So hopefully that the extensions from there are pretty clear. Um, so that was that whole whole thing last time. And I know at least a handful of you guys have talked about doing drone related projects. So this is good for that. Expect to see no Euler angles in your <laughs> drone projects. Uh, okay, cool. So now we're gonna switch gears all, um, and go into sort of a very different area that's Again, not so much a like, you know, classic optimal control topic, but definitely a robotics topic. Uh, so we're going to start talking about contact and uh, um, hybrid systems and legged robots and locomotion and this kind of stuff. This will be another couple lectures on this kind of, which is, a, you know, it's we use optimal control to do this stuff. It's a robotics thing. It does show up in a lot of areas, though. It's not just a legged robotics thing. I mean, it's manipulation. Also, you get this stuff, but it also shows up in... Um, I know from talking to Larry Beegler and Kemi, they actually have stuff in chem chemical engineering, like control where this sort of weird um, hybrid stuff shows up where they have discontinuous things, um, shows up in a lot of different areas. There's there's aerospace applications of this where people think about what they call state triggered constraints. So there's a lot of examples in a lot of areas and robotics, the classic sort of setting where you worry about this kind of hybrid system stuff um, is in uh, impacts and friction and kind of these discontinuous dynamics, things that show up mostly in legged locomotion, but also you know, manipulation and some other areas. So it is broadly useful, but we're going to definitely talk about it in the robotics context. Um, so we're going to talk about kind of first kind of an intro to contact dynamics to set the stage a little bit and tell you kind of why this is a thing, and then hopefully get into um, hybrid systems a little bit. as a sort of modeling paradigm uh, for doing control with these kind of contact stuff. And then finally, um, how to do trajectory optimization, which again, if you make it go fast enough, then it's MPC, right? So all that stuff with, um, with these kind of ideas for legged systems. And um, this will hopefully get you the core ideas and sort of enough to be dangerous. And if anybody wants to do a project in this area, you know, these are kind of the basic ideas and you definitely can. And then a little bit later, towards the end of the class, we're going to do a bunch of case studies and we will do a case study on, you know, how quadrupeds work basically. And I'll walk you through kind of the MIT cheetah, you know, sort of controller stack and like how it all goes together with these ideas and kind of give you the full stack perspective on it. Okay. Any questions about any of that? All right, let's get into it. So first, um, as just a kind of a basic intro to contact dynamics and why this is a sort of fascinating and frustrating little corner of, you know, math and physics. Um, let's kind of illustrate some of the ideas here. So I want to think about like for now, um, a bouncing ball, let's say. Uh, the classic ones, right, are bouncing ball or falling brick, you know, whatever, kind of all the same idea. So let's think about, you know, this thing's falling. Okay, here's the ground. Here's the ball, mass M. We got gravity, cool. And if we think about the trajectory of this thing for a sec, let's think about just the Z component versus time, right? It's doing this kind of thing, like your classic parabola type thing. And then maybe we think about the velocity. So if I toss this up in the air, maybe, you know, it might start out with a positive velocity, but the velocity is going to just decrease like this under gravity, right? Falling, cool. Um, that's all good. So, you know, this is right now what I just wrote down is in the air, right? In the air, this is all super nice, smooth dynamics, nothing weird. This is like, you know, freshman physics. Um, so even you CS majors who never took dynamics, you know, you've seen this before, how F equals MA, right? So this is all nice stuff. So in particular, we're talking about smooth ODEs. And something like, you know, mz double dot equals minus g. 
right? Uh, or mine, I sorry, minus mg. And the m's cancel out and no one cares about the mass. Okay, cool. So that's all good. Here's where it gets weird. Um, now let's look at when the ball hits the ground. And none of this is, you know, this is all kind of obvious if you think about it a little, but I didn't think about this stuff till I was like a postdoc. I came from aerospace and we didn't have to think about this stuff. And when I started thinking about it, I was like, oh, this is really weird and really interesting. Okay, so here's kind of our ground again. Let's think about the ball like right around the instant it touches down on the ground, right? So if I think about this, okay, it's falling, cool. Like at, there's some instant where it just touches the ground, let's say, right? So let's back up some like epsilon right before that. And it's got some velocity, say in the, you know, downward direction. Let's call that like V minus. So there's some like V minus where it's falling cool and like just before it touches the ground, right? And let's say, you know, if this thing bounces, there's some instant right after where it's going up and we'll call that V plus, okay? And so the, the idealized model here is that there's some instant where it touches down and bounces. And that really what we're saying here, the kind of inherent modeling assumption here is that the time, uh, the impact time, the time during which it's actually in contact and doing whatever weird deformation, elasticity stuff that actually happens, that time is very short compared to like the rest of the dynamics, right? Which is the case in robot stuff, right? We're talking about rigid bodies mostly and whatever. The impact time, the actual transition time during that, where there's actually like deformation in the objects and stuff like this, um, that's all like really, really short, like sub millisecond or whatever. And it's so short that we're not even going to resolve it. We're just going to have this like zoomed out kind of macro scale picture where there's some instant, we're assuming these contact things are instantaneous, basically. That makes sense that their time scales are really shorter than where we want to resolve. Okay. So that's kind of that idea. And now let's think about like the, we think about the, say the Z height, the position in the Z axis, you know, falling parabolic thing, cool hits the ground and then it bounces and it does something like this, right? Ah. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> I thought we were doing so well, you know? Life was good. And now. <laughs> Very annoying. Let's see. Let's see what we can do here. Do, 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 do. Hey. That was, could have been a lot worse. It came back. Okay, cool. So that's like the bouncing thing, sort of looking at the position coordinate, right? So let's start taking some derivatives. Okay, so let's look at Z dot now and think about what that looks like. So say we got this sort of thing versus time. Okay, so falling, 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 the velocities negative and getting bigger, right? Acceleration due to gravity. So let's say it looks kind of like this. And then at some instant when it hits the ground, what happens? It's positive, basically flips sign, right? And, and under these kind of modeling assumptions, it flips sign and basically becomes positive, right? And then you get another kind of thing like this. Cool. So this is V minus right here. And this is V plus right here. And basically we're saying there's this jump discontinuity in the velocities that happen when it hits the ground, right? Um, so, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but at the end of the day, what the, the kind of like critical idea here is because of these sort of jump discontinuities in velocity, non, this whole thing's non-smooth. And at the end of the day, that means we can't actually write this down just with differential equations, right? Because ODEs, implicit when we write f equals ma that's you know f x double dot or whatever it's assuming that x of t is twice differentiable and that we can actually take two derivatives i can't take two derivatives of that thing right um, i can't even really take one derivative it's it's uh discontinuous velocity right so the accelerations have crazy you know if i take another derivative of that i get like a crazy delta function spike at the impact time and all kinds of weird badness happens right so, um, so we can't even really do this with ODEs and we need to kind of think outside the box a little bit and do some, some slightly different things. And, um, there's sort of two, two options. And we'll talk about both of them. You've already seen some hints, uh, of at least one of these things, um, namely on homework one. 
Um, Well, maybe there's three <laughs> options, but the third one is not a good option. So we'll, we'll write down the kind of the two stock ones. Okay, so the two options, uh, the first one is so-called event-based or hybrid uh, formulation. In simulation land, it's generally called event-based and in control land, it's generally called hybrid. So the idea here is, you really like embrace the picture I just drew. Basically, if you're not near an impact, you write down that nice smooth ODE and you just do normal ODE things, use your run to cut a thing, life is good. And then you basically check for impacts with what's called a guard function. So you have some condition that you check. Like every time you do an integration step with your run to cut a method, you're always checking this guard function to see if you're near an impact, right? And so in this case, it would just be the Z height of the ball. You just check every time you take a step, you check to make sure the height's still positive. If the height flips sign, you're like, oh, I hit the ground, something happened. Then you kind of kick out of your Runka Kata step and you do something else. You do um, what's called a jump map, which executes that jump discontinuity kind of explicitly, like we just saw. And then, then you go back to integrating your nice ODE. So that's what you do. You basically do this explicit event detection for your impact events. Then you run a separate function called a jump map that does the discontinuous thing. And then you go back to your ODEs. So that's, that's the idea. ODE uh, while checking for contact events using a guard function. And typically in, in like robotics-y things, we, um, we write this as well, yeah, we'll do we'll that later. So here, like the height equals greater than or equal to zero. And then when contact happens, i.e. when Z is less than zero or crosses over, um, you execute this thing called a jump map. That explicitly models discontinuity. Then you just go back to your smooth OD again. Okay, cool. So that's option one. Um, and we're going to have code for this stuff in a, in a little bit. So I'll show you kind of how it all works in detail. Okay, option two is the one you actually got some hints of on homework one. You guys remember the falling brick example on homework one where we kind of turned it into a QP? So that's that's option two. Those are called time stepping uh, methods or in simulation they're called time stepping methods and then in in control land these are sometimes like the control version is sometimes called contact implicit and so the idea is we're going to take the all the dynamics and we're going to kind of like formulate the contact collision stuff as inequality constraints, where you end up with like, so you discretize time with whatever, like implicit Euler or something, you write down um, a sign distance function, which actually looks a lot like that guard function. That's just an inequality constraint saying, you know, fall doesn't go through the ground. And then you have, you set up a sort of an optimization problem that you just solve where um, the optimization problem is going to figure out what the contact forces or impulses in discrete time have to be such that you satisfy that impact constraint, such that the ball doesn't go through the ground. And that's what we did on that homework one with the falling brick QP setup. Um, so roughly speaking, uh, you're gonna solve a constrained optimization problem. Uh, at each uh this thing oh that was weird that enforces uh no interpenetration between objects 
we usually write that down as some distance function phi greater than or equal to zero. In the brick case, phi is literally just z, right? So it's the same as our guard thing we just wrote down. Um, by solving for contact forces, uh, sort of jointly with, with the next state. And this is exactly what happened on that homework one uh, brick problem. Cool. Any questions about those two things? Okay, so some some sort of like commentary on these ideas. Um, both of these are widely used. Um, and have like sort of various pros and cons, which we'll talk a little about. Um, so I would say in control, the hybrid formulation is like probably by far the dominant approach. Um, at least in legged locomotion. And this is what all the sort of like Boston Dynamics cheetah stuff is doing. And the reason is that um, it, it lets you easily, it easily just bolts on to standard stuff we already know how to do. So you can easily kind of just bolt that hybrid sort of approach onto Dirk Hall, DDP, all the, all the usual stuff we've done. And we're going to do that today. So see how that works. Um, and it sort of, you know, it it's, doesn't take a whole lot more machinery to deal with. And it's easiest to do this with something like their call. And that's what we're going to do. And that's, you know, um, the, the downside of this is that um, if you go down this hybrid route during, doing control, um, what basically ends up happening, if I were to use like direct collocation with this, I have to pre-specify the not points, basically the times that the contacts switch. So I have to like bake that into the problem in the form of some constraints. So I, uh, what this comes down to in practice is that, you know, you can solve free time problems. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to specify the exact time, but it means you have to specify the ordering. So for example, on a quadruped, it basically means I have to pre-specify the gate. Um, this is fine a lot of the times, but if you end up in complicated situations on say rough terrain, where you have to like reason about footstep placement really carefully, um, and you can't just kind of truck ahead with some stock like trotting gate, then it gets weird and weird things happen. Also in complex manipulation tasks where I could maybe where I have a hand grasping some object, then like the number of contact modes there is like almost infinite and it's crazy hard to decide how to grasp, right? So these things get weird and, and are not very effective in certain circumstances, but for like, you know, driving a quadruped around on flat ground or upstairs even works great. And that's what everyone's doing basically. So requires pre-specified uh, what we call a mode sequence. So the ordering of the contacts, basically. Okay, cool. Um, the uh, so these things are very successful in in locomotion and like kind of the standard thing. The alternative, the so-called contact implicit stuff, we've done a ton of work on this in my lab and tried pushing this like pretty hard. And the gist is, it doesn't need the mode pre specification, and in theory. It can just do everything. You just give it a problem and it figures out all the contacts and all the contact forces and all that's all in there. Um, but in practice, the optimization problems that you get in that setup are insanely hard to solve numerically, just really, really hard. And we've spent like probably five years trying to make that better. And it's it's better than it was five years ago, but it still kind of sucks if I'm being honest. So like, it, they're just really hard optimization problems. Uh, So 
So don't need mode sequence. Uh, but the optimization problems are a lot harder. Okay, cool. So that's the high level. Any questions on that stuff? Yeah. How, um, how big a loop is it that you usually go to like either one like modeling mismatches or two like four estimates that actually are your project or not? They're quite brittle. Uh, for sure, the second one is a huge challenge. Um, unplanned contacts are like the killer of all these things. Like if you like accidentally scrape the robot's foot on a step or something, it's like game over, today's plant. Um, model mismatch, like, eh, not so bad typically. Like that's in that respect, I'd say like they're kind of the same as anything else. Um, and in general, like these methods are quite, like if you have like, I don't know, masses or link lengths a little off or something, generally it's fine with that kind of stuff. But unplanned contacts, because again, they're like non-smooth, right? Like all these like parameter mismatch, model mismatch errors kind of things. Those are all like kind of smooth things, right? Where like, if I make the mass a little bigger or something, like the the right answer is, you know, close to the, that, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the, the answers smoothly vary as functions of most of those parameters. But if you like accidentally stub your toe, that's like a major difference that's like discontinuous, right? Um, compared to like what it wouldn't have, would have been otherwise. So that dramatically changes the answer. And then more like a model mismatch, like a one that would result in like a change in like a discontinuity. Like for example, if you think you're gonna hook something and you don't. Yeah, or like totally. Like different yep. kind of force and acceptance. So that kind of unplanned contact stuff, again, if it's like a difference between contact and not, like you, I don't know, you go to like grab something and miss, or you like hit something accidentally, that's catastrophic often. Um, like if it's a force that's a little off from what it should have been, that's usually not a big deal. In general, I'd say like things that are like, you know, a little off in, and they're like kind of smoothly varying things. Like if I had to squeeze this a little harder to, to like make it not slip or something, that's not that big a deal. But stuff that's like, I accidentally punched something or hit my shoulder on the doorway or went to grab this hold, hand, like this hold on the ladder and missed, it's, it's often just like game over and really bad. And there's like classic blooper reel footage from Boston Dynamics or, you know, DARPA or Challenge or take your pick, right? Um, there's like tons of blooper reel footage on this, exactly these kind of things. And if you look critically at a lot of these blooper reel things from BD, say, or, or a lot of these other kind of robots, um, basically all of the really dramatic face plant incidents are like, if you look carefully, you'll notice some kind of unplanned contact where it like accidentally hit its hand on something or missed a step or whatever and that's exactly what you're saying so yeah that's like a very insightful question like basically yeah almost all of the issues with current things like this are unplanned contacts okay having said that now let's see how how they they kind of work under the hood a little bit um good question yeah so when you mentioned the um the contact implicit case um and and say you saw for reaction forces um don't you still need to check like implicitly for like, you know, activate or uh, like uh, inactive kind of like um, uh, inequality constraints? Don't you still have to check for that? Uh, I mean, you explicitly write it as an inequality constraint. That was kind of the idea. So yeah, you're sort of, you're checking, you're using some kind of inequality constrained optimization technique, be it active set, anterior point, augmented Lagrangian, something like that to deal with the inequality constraints. So yeah, you're checking them, you're doing stuff with inequalities, yep. Okay, now. <clears throat> okay, cool. So here's how we're going to get into this. We're going to go through in some detail, both the time stepping and like uh, uh, contact implicit, I don't know, whatever, time stepping, uh, time stepping and hybrid things sort of in some detail for the falling brick, classic falling brick. The time stepping thing you already did on homework one. So um, we'll go through this a little quick. I just want to remind you. So here we go. Uh, mass. Say we have some initial V naught like this. Uh, damn it. This is very, very annoying. Why does it suck so much?
Okay, well. Why? Why is it like this? It works fine. Like last time it worked fine. It worked fine when we started class. And now, and also like the first time it, it reconnected just fine. But now we got spinning, oh, unable to connect. I don't understand this. It's like absolute trust of Okay, I'm gonna try. Try again. Ah, we may have to do a quick disconnect from Wi-Fi, reconnect things, since that seems to be the only way I get this to, to work. So apologies to Zoom people. We'll be back momentarily. It's like you're on mute. Okay, we're back. Sound is back. Everything is back. It's going to work. Thank you for bearing with me. Okay, so here we got this mass kind of falling, right? We're doing something. Ah, damn it. I really try not to swear on these because it's like on YouTube, but it's really hard sometimes. This is one of those times where it's really hard. Okay, so mass, we're sliding. Cool. The idea here is, right, we're going to like be flying through the air, we're going to fall, we're going to hit the ground, we're going to slide, right? It's falling brick like falls onto like ice, no friction. So falls, hits the ground, slides, this kind of thing, right? Cool. Okay. So you did this on homework one. So hopefully the ideas will be, this is a refresher um, and you should have seen this before. So first we're going to do the time stepping, which you saw on homework one. So here's the idea. We're going to write down dynamics so like mv dot equals minus mg falling and then we're going to write down a constraint that says it's not allowed to go through the floor and what that's going to look like is if we're talking like you know dynamics lingo there's sort of you know dynamics lingo and optimization lingo that get mixed here we're going to have this term where this guy is going to be called the um, contact jacobian or constraint jacobian And then this guy is going to be the contact force or impulse, depending on if you're in continuous or discrete time. That doesn't matter. Okay. And then we've got you know, kind of the usual stuff where G is going to be, you know, 9.8 kind of stuff in MKS units. Uh, our state is going to be um, this kind of notationally dubious but uh, we're going to be a little bit loose with notation here. So a state's got like our position, which we call Q and velocity V kind of stacked up in there, right? And then our sine distance function, which tells us if we're you know in contact or not, it's a function of the positions Q. And it's um, in this case, a really easy function. It's a linear function of the state. So it's just going to pick out the, I should write it that way. That's right, qx, qy. So it's just going to pick out the, the height, the y component. So this is qx, this is qy. And you just end up with that little, you know, Jacobian that picks out the um, the y component. And this is actually our contact Jacobian or constraint Jacobian for this problem, right? So phi equals j times q. And then up here, it shows up as j transpose lambda. That's the same one, right? So all that's doing, j transpose, right? It's just zero, one. And it's just telling you the contact force acts in that y direction. That makes sense? Cool. Okay, so this thing is called the sine distance function.
cool. So we take all that stuff. Then we discretize this with um, backward Euler, which is like Euler integration, but backward. Um, we kind of looked at this before, right? Uh, so that we're going to turn into, I'm going to be a little fast with this, but if you, if anyone's got any serious hangups, let me know. So literally all I'm doing is taking, you know, MA and discretizing it like this. So just, it's just a finite diff acceleration here. So this is VK plus one VK minus VK over H, which is the time step. That's MA, right? But discretized. And then on this side, I'm just going to take, uh, you know, all this stuff as, as before it doesn't change. Um, but you know, this is going to be a discrete time Lambda K. So like contact impulse. So that's F equals MA. And then I've got, um, I'm just like kind of integrating everything. So QK plus one equals QK plus H times VK plus one. That's the backward Euler part. I use VK plus one there instead of VK. That's what makes it backward. Then I've got, say, the sine distance function at QK plus one has to be greater than or equal to zero. So I have to stay above the ground. My next pose has to be, you know, above the ground. Um, my contact force has to be positive. The ground can't pull down on the brick. Right? I can only push up on the brick. That's what that says. And then the last one is that uh, I'm going to write it and then talk about it. So QK plus one, this is the height, right? It turns out we're going to write it like this. So these are all scalars in this case. So it's it's easy to talk about. These guys multiplied together have to equal zero. So what that says is that if I'm in the air, and phi of QK plus one is positive, that means uh, I can't have a contact force. So lambda has to be zero. If I'm on the ground where phi equals zero, then I can have a positive lambda so I can have a contact force. So what that literally says is that I can, I'm not allowed to have force at a distance. I can only have a contact force lambda be non-zero if I'm touching the ground, if phi is zero. Does that make sense? So that's what that all says. Um, so this is, let me write some of this down. So this is only pushing, no pulling. And this one is uh, no force unless you're actually in contact. Nope, it's one dimensional. It's a scalar. Is that cool? Is that cool? That makes... Yeah, but the direction comes from the J. Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's it. This was kind of on homework one. If you kind of stare at this for a second, you realize what these actually are. I just wrote these down from physics arguments. But if you look at that for a second, these are actually just the KKT conditions where we know from optimization. So we started from physics, but we landed at KKT conditions for an optimization problem. And it turns out these, in general, they're nonlinear KKT conditions. These ones, though, um, for this particular problem, actually end up being KKT conditions for a QP. And so you can write this down as actually a QP. And that was what I was on homework one. So this is a QP in disguise. Oops. So um, we can actually write this as the QP, which looks like this, min over VK plus one of basically one half MV squared uh, plus So I'm just like kind of re-manipulating this stuff around a little bit. It shouldn't be too hard to figure out how I got this. There you go. So that's a QP. And the KKT conditions for this are that thing we wrote down before. And now I can just use a Q, uh, QP solver to get this and life is good. Cool. So that's how you do it. We sort of saw this on homework one. Um, some interesting things to note about this. Um, the exact impact time is not resolved here. Like I don't actually know what the instant of impact was with this setup. I only know 
it happened during the last time step, say. I know over which time step it happened, but I can't tell you exactly when in that time step it happened. So this thing kind of like implicitly smears out <coughs> all these impact things over a time step. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oof. Okay. Um, other thing is that the contact forces or impulses which really doesn't really matter uh, are explicitly computed here, which they are not necessarily in the um, other version of this, the hybrid version. Um, uh, Q, yeah, you're right. Thanks. Okay, uh, that's true. And then uh, some other weird stuff here that's kind of important sometimes is the thing we just wrote down, like that whole QP setup actually explicitly depends on the Euler integration that I discretize with. It turns out it doesn't really generalize to higher order integrators. So I, I really can't write down like an RK4 version of that. So this is kind of limited to like first order integration accuracy, maybe second order, but there's some caveats, um, which is maybe not so great. Um, so this kind of means you ultimately end up needing to take small time steps. Um, and this is widely used. This setup is basically how Pi Bullet, Dart, Gazebo work. Mujoko kind of works like this, but does some hackier things actually that make it fast, but make the physics a little worse. So um, that. Dart, what else? Uh, that was a very weird, terrible handwriting. Uh, gazebo, et cetera. Lots of simulators do it like this. Okay, the key problem with this whole setup, if I want to do control with this, is these are my dynamics now. And essentially, if I remember if when we're doing collocation or whatever, these end up having to be constraints, the dynamics constraints in my control problem. And ultimately, what that would mean here is I'd have to take this whole set of KKT conditions and make them constraints in this other solver, right? Um, you can do this, but it turns out it's awful. And the real, real nasty part is actually that last condition, that complementarity condition. So if you think about what that looks like geometrically, it's sort of this like nasty um, sort of like, so if this is like, I don't know, um, phi... Uh, and lambda, if I were to plot them, it looks like this. Like the feasible set is basically like something like this, right? That's like got a corner in it. It has no volume. It's like a really, really gross thing. It's non-differentiable, blah, blah, blah. So all kinds of badness. And so it turns out like just naively throwing those conditions into a tragic problem like really does not work. It violates all these kind of smoothness and regularity assumptions that underlie um, most of the solvers. Why, why this? I mean, this is just those KKT conditions. If I work backwards and take these and try to write down the QP that gives you those, that's it. I don't know. Is that... Yeah, so there's there are a connection between this and what's called least action principle from mechanics, Hamilton's principle. This is basically Hamilton's principle. Um, it's not exactly, but it's very close. So yeah, it is closely related to like ideas for mechanics with like action minimization, energy minimizations. It's very, yeah, you can see it. It looks like one half MV squared, like energy kind of stuff, right? So yeah, this is almost least action, um, but not quite. But yeah, it's good, good catch. Uh, okay, complementarity, bad. <coughs> Uh, 
cool. That's the picture. Okay, cool. So that's that story. You kind of already saw this. So option two um, is uh, this this whole like hybrid thing. So let's talk about that. So this works in a completely different way. Um, so remember, the idea is we're going to have our smooth dynamics. So we're going to write down like, first, we've got x dot equals f of x. In this case, for the falling brick, that's going to look like, uh, you know, x dot. Um, so let's say, write it out in some more detail. So we've got q dot v dot equals, um, in this case, it's just v and then minus g, right? So we're going to call this our um, this is sometimes called a smooth vector field uh, or just dynamics. Cool. We've got a guard function, which tells us if we're in contact or not. And so for us, that's just so sort the of falling brick. It's just this guy. Um, yeah, it's just like the Z height, right? We just wrote it down guard function. So we check this thing every every time step. Then we've got the jump map that tells us what to do if we cross the guard. So in this case, that's telling us like if we hit the ground, what's supposed to happen? And in our case, it basically means you're going to like zero out the vertical component of the velocity or something like that, right? So let's write that down. So that looks like this. Uh, so for us, right, if we've got this whole thing written down, we've got like X component, Y component of the positions, we got VX, and then we're just going to zero out the Y component when we hit the hit the jump. So this, you know, if I zero out the vertical velocity, that's called an inelastic collision, right? That means I just go plop, which is what we're modeling, which is what the last thing did right you could you could think about bouncing that's a whole other thing we, we can talk about that but that's kind of the idea that's what it looks like so having defined all those things all those pieces the actual like kind of loop you run is pretty straightforward basically um looks like this so like while sort of while you're still going you're gonna do if i haven't crossed the guard function you just do your normal dynamic stuff. So RK4 on this guy or whatever you like. And you can use any integrator you want. So probably, you know, something like RK4. Um, and then if I do cross the guard, so let's say else, and, you know, this would be B equals zero, basically. Um, we're going to then run the jump map if that happens. And that's going to give me my like discontinuous stuff. And then that's basically it. So I'm glossing over like a couple details here. And in, in particular, in practice, you actually have to like maybe backtrack because what's going to really happen is you'll cross that guard function, you know, during a step and you're probably going to actually cross it. So it's like negative. And then what you end up having to do is do some kind of backtracking to like figure out the exact time. You can do that a bunch of ways, um, details. Uh, okay, so in here, we actually um, get the precise impact time. We don't necessarily have to compute the impact forces explicitly though. So that's like kind of a weird, you know, thing you, you can, but it's sort of a separate thing you'd have to do. Um, and then here you can use high accuracy integrators. You can use RK4, take big steps, all that good stuff. So these are kind of contrasts with the other stuff. Uh, 
And this is kind of widely used uh, for strategy opt MPC, all the stuff we we like. Um, so the the key idea here is like basically for doing MPC strategy opt, etc. Um, the main idea is that if I can specify the times when the contacts are gonna happen, I can essentially, you know, bake those in as a bunch of constraints with that jump map. And I don't have to optimize over any of this like discontinuous stuff. It's all kind of like pre specified. Yeah, what's up? Because that should already be zero. That's like checked by the guard, right? So that's like the position where I am at. Like if I'm doing things right, that should just be zero, right? I don't want to force it to be. I want it to like fall until it gets there, right? Cool. Uh, okay, so it's right there. Yeah. So do we get overloading the innovation? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So what is X? So that's supposed to indicate that it's like not X dot. It's sort of, it changes X instantaneously. It's the new X. Yeah. The bouncing It flips. And so the general idea there, that's called an elastic or, or you know, uh, so inelastic collision means it's zero. It just goes plop. And elastic collision means it bounces and it flips sign. And then there's sort of like an in-between where it, flip sign but gets like reduced by some constant factor. So is this only for an inelastic collision? So the hybrid stuff can do either thing. Um, in the in the inelastic case, that's what I wrote. The elastic case, it would flip sign and I'll show you this in the code in a sec. So we'll talk about it. Uh, so the idea here is if we know or sort of like can assume the impact times a priori, uh, we don't we don't need the guard function. And we can just deal with uh, kind of your f of x and and uh, g of x in here, which are differentiable. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, let's see. So let's take a quick look at some code for that. So you get a feel for how it actually works a little bit. Um, so this is the bouncing ball thing, falling brick thing. I don't know. You can call it whatever you want. It's the same thing. Um, it's a point mass. Uh, so hopefully this doesn't suck too bad. Um, okay, so here's continuous dynamics. That's what we wrote down. Uh, minus G, you know, that's it. It's going very, very slow. Yeah. So hopefully that doesn't take too, too long. We're going to do RK4 on the smooth dynamics. That's all good. Here's my guard function. So it literally just returns the, the Y component, the height, right, from the state. Cool, no problem there. Here's my jump map. So this is what we wrote down um, and we're gonna do the bouncing case too. So here it looks like I actually did zero out the height explicitly. So thanks for that. You shouldn't really have to, right? It should already be there. In this case, I'm being a little bit lazy. Um, I'm not gonna backtrack here. So by like actually just zeroing it out and making sure it never goes negative, but it's cheating a little bit and it's not really what you should do. You should, if you wanna be legit about this, you should backtrack till it's like exactly zero and then, you know, this all works out, but yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, cool. And then here I'm actually gonna, we're gonna try it both ways. So this is inelastic right now. I'm setting this this um, gamma to zero. In general, this is called a coefficient of restitution. And if I want to make it bounce, I flip the sign, which is the minus sign, and I multiply it by some constant less than one uh, between zero and one, right? And that'll give you like the classic sort of bouncing sort of lower, lower kind of thing, right? So let's, we'll try that both ways. Um, I'm going to start it like a meter off the ground with some initial velocity. We're going to simulate this at 100 hertz for three seconds, and we're going to do exactly what we wrote down. So call this RK4 step, then check if the guard's violated. If it is, I do the jump thing. Otherwise, I keep going. So the guard 
function is to the tool is not right, it should be less than equal to because we will often overshoot in the pseudocode. In the pseudocode, did I did I write less than? Oh, yeah. I mean, so yeah, in practice, what you want to do is detect if it crosses and then backtrack till it's exactly equal. That's like what you should do. We're being a little, we're cheating a little bit. But yeah, so I wrote this here. Basically, what you would like to do is interpolate or backtrack back to exactly equals, right? But the detection thing, yeah, you're doing less than equal to. Hopefully, like the combo of the code and the notes gets you the idea. I mean, the important thing is like you get the idea and you can actually implement this. Yeah. You need to interpolate back, keep track of the amount of time that passed, jump, and then interpolate forward to keep the time in. No. Yeah, I mean, in general, we're doing this in continuous time. We're actually like trying to think about this as continuous trajectories with like instantaneous impacts at particular times. So the idea here is you would like to, you know, find exactly when this thing hit the ground, get to that time, do your jump thing, and then keep going forward and with your continuous, you know, ODE solution. So when I say interpolate here, like a good way to do this would be if you're using RK4, implicitly actually under the hood, you're you're actually, you've got a cubic spline interpolant for that trajectory with RK4. So what you can do here in this backtrack interpolation thing is you can actually um, dig into that cubic spline that is actually what the solution to that RK4 step is. And you can interpolate along it back till it exactly crosses zero. And you can solve that with like a root finding problem on that cubic polynomial, right? Does that make sense? That's like the legit way to do that. And then you would go there, execute jump map, and then keep going from that, that jump state. Nice. So you use time. Yes. So what do you rest the time state? You just don't worry about it. So you just put your state there at that time. Execute the jump map, and then those are your new initial conditions, and you step from there, right? Yeah. Uh, because, so your forward velocity, right? If you back that, you haven't integrated some of that x, and so if you don't integrate after the reset map, there's like a a dip in your forward velocity there because you're only no, you you backtrack on the entire state solution. So I have this whole x of t. I'm going to backtrack on all of the state along that cubic interpolant for the for the state trajectory, right? Until the guard is exactly satisfied. I have a full state at that time. I execute my jump map at that time. Now I have a set of new initial conditions like X prime of T star or whatever. And I start running my integrator again. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, in general, I'm, I can use adaptive stepping here. The exact step size doesn't matter. I can change the step size, right? So like, yeah, this is not compatible with fixed step integration. I think that's like the main thing. In general, you're going to have to tweak the time steps around the impact timing if you're going to resolve the exact impact time. That's kind of the general idea here. I'm being fast and loose and cheating here to make things easier. But yeah, in general, you'd want to use a variable step integrator. You'd want to interpolate back and find the exact time for these things that when they happened. And like, I'd say this stuff is generally like very much from like a continuous time dynamics kind of perspective. So you're thinking about time as this continuous thing. You're not really thinking about it in discrete time steps. And in fact, you definitely can't. You have to like, kind of get a finer time resolution around these impact events to make this stuff work. And you can't just truck ahead at these fixed time steps. Is that cool? All right. Um, and the corollary to that is in the trajectory optimization setting, you really need to do this with a free time formulation. Because what you need to do is let the tragop solver tweak the times around the impact events so that everything lines up. Okay, cool. So this is the simulation loop. Any questions there? Again, yes, you guys have picked up on all of my Sort of crappy hacks. So good for you. I cheated. I did. I was lazy. But you know, you get the the right idea. Hopefully. Okay. Cool. So here's what happens. Falls hits the ground. Slides. Cool. What we expect. Uh, no surprises. Uh, this is the velocity. Um, so you see, it has this like, you know, it's falling, accelerating. Cool. Jump discontinuity zero. Let's go play around. So what I'll do is I'll go back here. I'll make this something else. We'll make it bounce. So let's try like 0.9. So it's like you know, pretty elastic, do the same thing. Now we get this bouncing behavior, cool, what you expect. And like, all these things look, you know, fine. That's what you expect, cool. Okay, so yeah, play around with this, check it out. Definitely, if you want, you can really do it right and implement it the right way, which I recommend, like you should do that. I was being lazy, so, you know. Um, so the way this works in practice is you you end up solving, like if you're doing MPC, you end up like doing this one of two ways. So 
the kind of legit way is you put in these impact events, blah, 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 and you end up solving a free time trajectory optimization problem, which we kind of talked about where the, the DTs in your uh, tra trajectory are treated as decision variables, control variables, and the solver can adjust them. So that's like the legit way to do this. The other option is you basically like um, use a fixed, you know, gate timing that comes from some plan and you just kind of line that up with your time steps and try to like force the, the system to act that way, right? Which, you know, maybe that works. Maybe it's kind of grabby, I don't know. So those are kind of your two options. But yeah, there's sort of this, this is always lurking in there, like this, this idea, right? Okay. And yeah, in practice, like if I'm doing this at like more than a hundred Hertz, like the uncertainty in my contact timing is probably more than that. So like, it probably doesn't matter. Like if I'm doing this at hundred Hertz, I have 10 millisecond resolution on that time. I probably don't know it to within 10 milliseconds on the hardware anyway. And in practice, we usually run this even faster than that. So if we're running this at a few hundred Hertz, we're talking like millisecond sort of level discrepancies there. It's, it's in the noise. Okay. Cool. So that's hybrid dynamics. I should say the QP version you guys already saw, right? That was on homework one. So go back and check that out if you're if you want to compare these. That'd be kind of fun. We're going to keep trucking and start talking about how to do control. Okay. Deep breath. See how far we can get. So here we go. Hybrid trajectory optimization. Um or legged robots. We're gonna do the classic copper, which is the uh, robot. I can't talk and write at the same time, it's hard. I don't know if anyone else can do that, but tricky. Okay, cool. So uh, one-legged hopper, the simplest legged robot you can make. We're gonna make a very, very simple planar hopping robot. Got your ground. Get your, we're going to treat like basically it as two point masses. So we got like a body, some mass. We've got a leg with like a prismatic joint. We've got a foot mass. We've got, you know, some force that we can exert here. And we've got some torque we can exert here. There's like two inputs. We can torque it around and we can exert force between the body and the foot. So the state for this is just going to be um, the position of the body, the position of the foot. Velocity of the body, velocity of the foot. And again, this is all 2D. So it's just X, Y for each of these. So this is eight dimensional. And then the control input is just going to be this force exerted between the foot and the body, which is a scalar, right? That's a 1D control input, prismatic joint, right? And then this torque that we can exert um, sort of between the body and the foot. So I can kind of work things around, right? There's various ways to implement this on hardware. This is a very simplified picture of this, this thing. But this is like a, a sort of dumbed down version of the classic Raber hopper, sort of like a planar version of a Raber hopper. Okay, so we got to write down some dynamic stuff now. So we're going to define the jump map to transition between modes. So here's what we got. So um, there's going to be a couple of these. So we'll define this as G21. Um, so this is going to be the impact one. So this one we've got, we're going to leave the positions alone. Um, we're going to leave the body velocity alone. We're going to zero out the foot velocity. That's the thing that's hitting the ground. And here we're going to zero out both the normal and the tangential components. So we're assuming... It's, it's hitting the ground, there's an impact, it's not going through the floor, and we're like assuming that it's in static friction, that there's friction, right, that it's sticking. Cool. So if you wanted to be super legit about that, you'd also put in a friction cone constraint to make sure you don't, like, slip, but we're going to just, for now, assume that it's not going to slip. Cool. It's it's a multi-body system. So we're assuming there's a body and a foot. And right now we're just making them like point masses. And there's like a prismatic joint between them. Two masses, body and foot. Which is a very simple model. It's the simplest one we could make, right? For something like this. And then um, the other one, which is transitioning from um, stance to flight. So when I jump off the ground. For this, it's just an identity map in our case. It's extremely simple.
Okay, cool. So that's it. Really easy. All you got to worry about is that impact condition where you zero out the foot velocity. And now we're going to do the way this hybrid thing works is I'm going to uh, sort of pre-assume a, a mode sequence for a hopper. There's only two modes. It's either standing on the ground or in the air. There's nothing else you can do. So it's really, really easy. So all I'm going to do is make alternating sets of knot points. Like I'm going to do five knot points, five knot points, stance, flight, stance, flight, stance, flight. We're just going to alternate. So super easy. Yep. There is absolutely. Yeah. So you're going to have like basically a leg length constraint where we're assuming there's a prismatic joint that can do this. So there's some minimum distance and some maximum distance that's going to be in the code. So we will absolutely, I'll walk you through that. Um, so here we're going to assign modes to alternating uh, groups of knot points. Uh, by enforcing the appropriate constraints. I'll show you what that looks like. So let's say for k equals one to n one, so like the first mode, we're going to have our uh, dynamics. So this is like our mode one dynamics. And we're going to say this, if this is a stance phase, we're going to basically write it like this. So we're going to have dynamics, stance phase dynamics that assume the foot's on the ground or constrained to be on the ground. And then we're going to have this constraint that it's got to stay on the ground, right? Okay. So that's the first, say five knot points in our case. And then the next group of knot points. So for K equals say N one plus one, to N2, so like mode two, we're gonna write down dynamics in mode two. So these would be the flight phase dynamics now. And then here we've got our sine distance function having to be uh, strictly greater than zero, right? And then we would have say, um, at the end of that, we'd have the jump map for the impact, right? So between say N2 and N3, we're gonna have a, a, a jump happen. So this would be like um, X N2 equals G21, you know, X, uh, say, that's weird. Like that. And then we'd sort of do the, Uh, enforce that it has to be in contact, right? So at the end of this, like last one, we'd sort of basically say, okay, jump map, and then you've got to be stuck to the ground for the next thing. And then we kind of repeat this, right? Okay, any questions about this? It's a little fast and loose, but I'll show you the code. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's for all of those K's between one and N1. I guess I should write it like this here as well. So yeah, the dynamics look like that. This is enforced for all of those knot points, right? In that interval. And then this is like, you know, at the boundary between these intervals, I've got to do a jump map and then I've got to enforce the, the on the ground constraint for the next round, right? That kind of thing. Yeah. What is the last so last line is like, um, so, okay, so I'm assuming I start out in stance, right? We said, you know, for this problem, when I leave the ground, like there's no real jump map there. That's sort of, I just leave the ground, cool. I just stop enforcing the, your bolted to the ground constraint. Maybe because to the air. Sorry? Maybe because stance to the air. Maybe. Stan transition from stance to flight is at N1. Yeah. At N2, that's where I transition, that's where I hit the ground. And I transition from flight back to stance. When that happens, I have to run that jump map that zeroes out the foot velocity when I hit the ground. So that's what that's saying. This guy is saying that. Sorry, he's speak up. So you only have to do that at one point in time. I have to do that every time I transition from flight to stance, right? So I'll show you in the code, but yeah, we'll do like a bunch of these in the code, with several hops. So when you leave the ground, it's all fine. When you hit the ground, you have to run the jump map. 
Exactly. Yeah. So I didn't bother with it here. I'm being a little loose with this specifically for this problem. Right. Cool. Everyone cool with that? Okay. Do you have two different time scales since you don't know a priori like what fraction of the cycle will spend in the air versus what fraction is going So what we're going to do here is we're going to just specify it as a set of constraints that they have to happen at these times. And then I'm going to have the solver give me a controller, a control policy, like a control trajectory that does it. Okay. So this is it. We're not here, right? We can we can do all kinds of things with this, but really like, because at the end of the day here, we're solving for a control trajectory. I can just put these in as arbitrary constraints and say controller, figure it out. So in this case, right, we're going to force the controller to actually hit the ground at those times. You could make it a free time problem and let the control, like let the optimizer figure out like nice times to touch down and lift off that minimize some other costs that you cared about, right? And there might be some, like definitely for bipedal walking, there's like natural minimum energy gate frequencies that pop out due to like the passive pendulum dynamics of your legs and stuff like this. Here, we don't care about any of that and we're just gonna kind of let it rip. Okay, any other stuff before we do the code? All right, let's do the code. Okay, so, trying to make this big, zoom in. All that hopper. This is fun. Okay. There's a lot of, oh, please don't do stupid, stupid things on me. Uh, boo. Okay. I'm going to kill this. And try to make this not suck. Weird package versioning crap between the two scripts. So let's hope it doesn't act too stupid. Okay. Cool. So let's like walk through this a little bit. So this is like all the stuff we wrote down, um, eight states, two controls. This seems a little weird. Um, this is just because I, I like invented a sort of length of time between hops and that that's what it worked out to you for like four or five hops. Um, we're going to run it at 10 Hertz. Uh, this is me saying I'm, what I'm doing is assigning five knot points, five time steps to each mode. So five steps for stance, five steps for flight, five steps for stance, blah, blah, blah. And they're all fixed time. So each each mode is half a second, basically, right? In this setup. Um, and then this is all boilerplate. Number of time steps, blah, 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 number of modes. Um, this is a bunch of like index math. So I can index into the giant vector of control uh, of, of uh, optimization variables and the solver to pick out the things I want to pick out. Um, hopefully this doesn't take too, too long to recompile a bunch of things now. Uh, um, okay, so that's not bad. Here's the dynamics. So I'm making like arbitrary things. So gravity, we're going to set the body mass to like five kilograms, the foot mass to one kilogram. This is getting back to your question before about the length of that leg. So here I'm saying the minimum length is half a meter. The maximum length is one and a half meter. So I don't know. I'm making it up. It's arbitrary, but you get the idea. So that was going as constraints. Um, and then here's our dynamic. So I have a flight dynamics function, which is just literally just F equals MA for those two masses. And then um, the weird part, so that's that's this stuff, that's easy. Um, here's the stuff that's a little weird. This B matrixy thing, um, what this is actually doing is literally just mapping the torque and the prismatic joint force into like forces and torques on the whole body. So like this stuff here is basically a little cross producty thing for that torque calculation. So if you stare at this for a minute, hopefully it's it's clear, but not too too bad. Um, and this is calculating like the directions along which that prismatic joint force acts, right? These are like the unit vectors pointing between the, the body and the foot. Okay, cool. All good. That makes sense. So it's just minus G on the Y coordinates. And then this is like, you know, computing F equals MA. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the prismatic joint, right, is supposed to be acting between these guys. So I have these two positions. I compute the unit vector from this guy to this guy, and that's the direction to push, right? And it's equal and it's pushing between them. So it's applying equal and opposite directions to both, right? So that's that's all that B matrix stuff says. That makes sense. Cool. Okay. Cool. Uh, what else? Okay, so that's the flight phase. Stance phase looks exactly the same. The only difference is, is that I've zeroed out all the stuff having to do with the foot because it's stuck to the ground. Make sense? Okay. Then we're just going to do RK4 on that, like you said. 
Um, and then here's my jump map. Like we said, we're just zeroing out the velocities of the foot. Everything else we leave alone. Okay, everyone cool with that stuff? Okay, so cost function, I'm just making stupid stuff up. So it's like identity. I'm making the control weights really small. Um, I think that's that. Quadratic cost function, like we always do. This is the cost function, quadratic, whatever, stage cost, terminal cost. I'm not. I'm not pre-specifying that. Just of the foot. The body still has non-zero, whatever. Can do whatever it wants, right? Subject to that length constraint limit that they can only, you know, there's a leg length in there, basically. Okay, this is the cost function just written out all the way for IP opt. So here's where this becomes an art and where there's like a, you know, voodoo-y magic involved in making these things work. I've done this a lot in my life, so I know how to do this, like, and I just kind of like hacked this up and it worked first try, but like, you know, this is where you got to like think a little bit. So what I'm doing here is giving this an initial guess to the solver. I'm giving it this like reference trajectory that I'm just making up. That's literally just a sinusoid on like the Z height and, you know, that kind of thing, right? So I'm doing linear interpolate. So I'm basically trying to get it to hop forward. So what I did was like give it a linear interpolation on the X position and a like sinusoid on the on the Z height of the body. And then I like um, on the leg, I, you know, I just put in like, again, a linear interpolation on the X coordinate, nothing for the, for the height or anything else. Uh, cool. I mean, so this is, I'm just making this up. It's not dynamically feasible. It's just kind of me cartooning what I think roughly this should look like. There's some sinusoidally thing on the height and like just moving to the right. So yeah, just to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, I'm just doing that on the height of the, the body, right? So like sinusoidal hopping seems reasonable to me. Okay, cool. Here's the constraints. I'm just making it up. I just made it up. So I said, you know, half second on the ground, half second in the air, right? I wrote those constraints down. This, I'm just giving it a period of half a second. I'm not, it doesn't, if this. Bad, like, point, yeah, if it's a bad guess, it probably won't. But like the thing here is like, none of this has to actually be feasible. This doesn't have to obey the physics. It doesn't even have to obey those constraints on the stance and whatever. I'm just making something up that's like plausible. So like I, exactly. Yeah. I mean, just again, you can give it an infeasible guess, right? So I'm giving it a guess that like moves to the right and bounces up and down like sinusoidally at the half second period or whatever that I made those stance flight based constraints, right? It's something that's in the ballpark. And, you know, you want to give it something in the ballpark to help it converge, right? And that's, I just cartoon that. It's really dumb, but it's like something kind of reasonable. And it turns out that works, right? So this kind of game of like, giving guesses like this is super important in practice and sort of just a thing you have to get good at. Okay, um, here's the constraints. This is doing exactly what we just talked about. So um, first mode, stance dynamics, second mode, flight dynamics, end of the second mode, jump map, back to stance phase, next mode, stance phase, next mode, flight phase, that's it, right? So it's a couple hops, cool. And you can keep doing this if you want to, but that's, that's it. Um, that stance constraint, this is just uh, kind of what we talked about, like sort of saying it has to be on the ground. Uh, at, and this is sort of, this is that in like index gymnastics is very annoying, but that's that's all it's doing. It's indexing into the right spots and like setting the stance sort of like to be what it needs to be. This is the length constraint between the body and the foot that we talked about. Um, this is stacking up all the constraints and like doing a bunch of index gymnastics to make it all talk to IP op. This is a bunch of boilerplate IP op code that's a very ugly and stupid, and you shouldn't really have to do this. And thankfully, Kevin is very nice and wrapped IP opt in a really nice one liner um, that matches the interface of FMIN, Con, and MATLAB. If you use that before, so it's like very, very clean, and you don't have to have all this boilerplate garbage anymore. So hopefully, that'll, that'll be in your next homework, and it'll be much nicer than this. Um, so, yeah, this is that guess that we talked about with the sinusoidal stuff. Um, this is just now I'm gonna, we're going to solve the problem. We'll see how long this takes. Um, I ran, this is mostly the JIT overhead of Julia and not actually the solve time. Like the solver's not even running yet doing JIT stuff, but it takes actually like a few seconds. It's not, not too bad, but now we're gonna have to sit here and let the Julia JIT compiler run again, uh, because I had to restart the notebook. So you can see like, I don't know, 76 iterations, super reasonable. What did this thing take? Did it tell you in time in seconds somewhere? 17 seconds. Yeah. So it's pretty reasonable. Um, 
Now I'm just going to pull out the solution. We can look at some stuff. So this is the body Z height. You can see the sinusoidal kind of thing happening, right? This is the foot Z height. As you can see, stance, flight, stance, flight, pretty clearly, right? And it's like right on zero during stance, which is what we want. Uh, these are like the X components for the body and the foot. You can kind of see, well, for some of these things, it's pegged at fixed locations when it's in stance. Otherwise, doing kind of sinusoidally moving to the right type stuff. These are controls. I don't know if there's anything useful to extract out of that. And then let's like watch the, uh, the visualizer because that's the fun thing. I'm just gonna let this thing kind of run and we'll see how long it takes to actually do its thing. I try to pre-run these so they compile and do their JIT thing before lecture, but annoying computer things today meant that that did not work out. So, hey, there you go. All right, cool. So yeah. let's do it again. Super fun. Magic. So cool. Okay. So yeah, actually, so you can actually go really far with it. Again, this is like the core ideas that we just talked about. This is like how all the magic awesome stuff that you see is done. It's basically just this scaled up to like more complicated models, right? Bigger robots, whatever. But the, the exactly what you said, this is like how BD, this is like the core ideas behind what BD is doing and like, you know, MIT Cheetah, all the really, really kick-ass robot stuff you see on Legged Robots. This is basically it. This is like the core idea. Collocation with like this hybrid constraints. Yeah. Where are you taking care of the transforming over? Nowhere. Why is it not falling? Why would it fall over? That would have a high cost. <laughs> so yeah, there's this is offline planning right now, right? So to actually get this to run on a real robot, you now have to think about like tracking control to stabilize so this so it doesn't fall over, right? So that's a whole other thing. And there's like you know, to do MPC kind of like this, you have to run this really fast on the hardware, you know, worry about like unplanned contacts and like all kinds of badness and stuff. So getting to work on hardware is really hard. Doing it offline and sim like this, not so hard, right? Like we just did this in an hour. Um, I coded this up in a you know a couple hours. Uh, so you get the idea. Uh, this stuff's actually extremely powerful. Like you do very cool things with this. Robot backflips, all kinds of good stuff. So if anyone's into this legged robot stuff, yeah, for, for projects, there's like very cool things you do this. Um, last year homework, we did a biped like this um, as like the homework problem. I don't know what we're going to do this year. Talk to Kevin, see if he's, he's down to do that and polish that up a little bit. But yeah, there'll be something like this on the on the last homework um, on a slightly more interesting, maybe a biped, maybe a quadruped or something uh, to get some more, more of this going. Um, anyone want to try anything else? We got two minutes. Otherwise, we're, we're kind of done. You make a dog. But if I make it, you do the foot elastic version. Uh, or does that mess with too many things? I mean, you could. I mean, it, it won't. It'll still work. Um, but I feel so. Generally speaking, like in in most of the robotics applications, um, we assume inelastic collisions for things like feet hitting the ground. Okay. It's just I've never seen anyone do anything else. If I'm being honest, like uh, this is the standard kind of setup. Um, I'd say like yeah. Generally speaking, I'm pretty inelastic. <laughs> Right. Uh, so it seems like a reasonable assumption. Can you message the reactive trajectory? Yeah, what do you want me to do? Can we get a negative? You want me to like make it harder and mm -hmm. screw with it a little bit? Yeah. You can try. Yeah. Um, it might barf. I don't know. So, okay. I added some random noise. You want me to like, uh, I don't know, flip the sign on this guy? Yeah, and like add some also to make it a box. So here, this is actually, I think this is even dumber. This actually, I think is, uh, I centered it on one. So it's oscillating between, you know, 1.5 and 0.5. What do you want me to do? Get it above the sound. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, I do what you OK, let me put the whole thing in the air. <laughs> OK, let me try that. Uh, so here, what did I make? How about this? So the foot right now is like, uh, this one to you. This is x coordinate. Uh, what's four? I think four is all zeros. The foot's just pegged at zero. I can put the foot in the air. Okay, let's try that. Uh, cool. All right, let's see what happens. I can do some pretty evil things and try to make this harder, but I don't know that that's helpful. <laughs> uh, where did I put this other stuff? Cool, this is cool. 
Um, let me, so I, I'm not going to do that then. We just put everything up in the air. Let's see if it works. It'll probably figure it out. Would be my guess. It might take a few more iterations. I mean, like the guess I gave it wasn't particularly good. Uh, yeah, let's see what happens. We might land on a different solution, local infeasibility. So it looks like it didn't didn't solve all the way. And sort of was unhappy with us. Let's see what it spit out. Yeah, it's kind of crappy. That's the, the heads going through the ground or something. Some bad stuff. So yeah, it gave us a, a shitty solution. Uh, let's see what that looks like out of curiosity. Oh yeah, <laughs> there you go. Face plant. I mean, it did a face plant. And, you know, the head went through the ground, which is bad. So yeah, not great. So yeah, the guess matters. I guess this is the takeaway message, and that's a bit of a black art voodoo kind of you know situation where you just have to like get good at this stuff. Yeah. Um, whenever you see lots of dynamics or lots of being like confused, like yeah, like is that like <laughs> is that considered up in contact or is that being not up in That's more like disturbances. Like they're exerting forces on the body, basically, right? Um, and actually that stuff you can do incredibly well just with LQR. Like if you're just sitting there standing, like they have a, you know, one from a long time ago of just standing on one foot and then like hitting with hockey sticks and stuff that you can just linearize the dynamics in that like one foot balancing pose and just run LQR and it, it'll do this and like kind of figure it out. That's just disturbance rejection. That's if you like stay in the same boat. What about yeah, yeah. Really, like, stagger off? To the side? Yeah, that's a lot harder. Yeah. So that yeah, stuff. Like yeah, they're doing MPC. And then like, there's a lot of papers on this kind of thing. Um, this is called push recovery. So usually what happens there is there, there's a bunch of heuristics that people have developed for like this push recovery idea. So roughly speaking, what they're doing is saying, oh, my momentum looks like this. I'm going to stick my foot out in the direction of my momentum to try to zero out my momentum at the next touchdown. And they run this like outer loop heuristic, like push recovery mode thing to try to like plan footsteps to like arrest the fall. Uh, so there's like a lot of work on that. It's a whole, yeah, whole thing. All right, guys, anything else? That's it for today. Thanks. <laughs>